All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Semel Grand Rounds. Um, today we have Dr. Daniel Levitin from McGill University um, talking about connections between music and the brain and applications to health and well being as well. I think it'll be a really interesting, exciting talk. Um, if you have any questions for Dr. Levitin, um, feel free to write that in the Q&A at any point, either during the talk or once questions have begun. Um, also remember that you have to fill out the survey in order to claim CME credit. So the survey will either open immediately upon closing the Zoom, or you will get an email around noon tomorrow. Um, and with no further ado, I will now turn it over to Dr. Bilder to introduce the speaker. Thank you so much. It's, it's really a, a huge honor and pleasure for me to introduce someone who I think is one of the most remarkable individuals that any of us has ever met. Uh, his website refers to him as a neuroscientist, musician, and author, uh, but this is not the usual triple threat that we're familiar with in academia. And uh, some aspects of his career trajectory, uh, trajectory may seem typical of one of our uh, typical Grand Rounds academic leaders. Uh, he had a bachelor's degree in psychology and cognitive science from Stanford, where he worked with Roger Shepard. He got his master's and PhD at the University of Oregon, working with Michael Posner. He did postdoctoral work at Stanford and UC Berkeley, albeit he did squeeze in additional studies at MIT and the other Berkeley, the College of Music in Boston. Uh, and he's authored more than 400 works and done a similar number of presentations. Uh, he also mastered the art of neuroimaging, served on the faculty at Stanford, Berkeley, and then for a couple of decades at McGill University, where he continues to enjoy the status of Professor Emeritus in the Department of Psychology, but he also has appointments in the schools of music, education, medicine, and computer science. Uh, he's now also the founding Dean of Arts and Humanities at the Minerva Schools at Keck Graduate Institute in San Francisco. And at this point, we'd usually be done introducing one of our world-renowned Grand Round speakers, but not Dr. Levitin. We haven't even gotten to the musician and author part. So I just want to quickly touch on his work as a best-selling author. You may have seen or read This Is Your Brain on Music or The World in Six Songs or The Organized Mind, if you were lucky, or A Field Guide to Lies, uh, or now one of his uh, newer books, The Changing Mind and Successful Aging, which I'm desperately reading right now. So please read those books. Um, but let me further highlight a few contrasts that illustrate that Dr. Levitin is not our typical Grand Round speaker. So you've heard others who have authored papers in science, nature, PNAS, but how many have also published in The New Yorker, Atlantic, The Wall Street Journal? You've heard others who've delivered scholarly talks at leading scholarly societies, but how many have also delivered addresses to Parliament in London or the United States Congress? And you've listened to speakers whose work have been covered in The New York Times, but how many have also been covered by Rolling Stone? And some, have music as a pastime or a hobby, but how many have played with Sting or Victor Wooten? How many have produced music by Stevie Wonder, Steely Dan, and Joni Mitchell? How many have 17 gold and platinum records? Dan does. I've personally had the opportunity to hear him lecturing with the legendary Rene Fleming at the LA Opera, and in the same year, heard him play with Victor Wooten at the Catalina Club. This is uh, an experience that uh, you are um, really in for today. Um, today, we have the opportunity to experience Daniel Levitin live at the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. Thank you, Dan. Oh, well, thank you for that generous introduction, Bob, and for not dwelling on all the fruitless hours I spend mindlessly in front of the television set. Uh, it makes it, it makes it like I'm uh, more productive than uh, my actual TV viewing would indicate. Before I start, I'd like to thank you and Dr. Helt for inviting me and Ernie Vasquez for helping us with the AV. And um, I'm going to get started here with the presentation. And so, yes, I'm going to talk about music in the brain, uh, applications to health and well-being. And uh, most of my work, I would say, is basic science. Uh, it has clinical applications, and I try to stay alert to them. And it impacts on creativity and learning. And the areas of overlap can be quite substantial, it turns out. The field that I'm in, music cognition, is interdisciplinary, and it requires that we collaborate with people uh, from neuroscience, developmental psych, genetics, as you already see, music, social psych, cognitive 
psychiatry. Um, all of these things need to come together. And as the builder generously uh, mentioned, uh, we've been lucky to have our work published in a variety of papers, uh, papers published in a variety of journals. The nature of the work being interdisciplinary lets us publish in specialty journals such as these. Uh, we've worked with psychiatric patients, patients with neurodevelopmental or neurogenetic disorders, collaborated with researchers in psychiatry, biology, education, genetics, pharmacology, neurosurgery, and music, some of which I'll talk about today. Uh, we've also published in a, a range of other specialty journals and more generalized uh, generalist journals, including two cover stories, uh, which uh, who knew uh, that people would be that interested in some of the mechanics of music perception. By way of overview, I just want to dispel a common myth. When I was in uh, my undergraduate training, we were taught that music happens in the right hemisphere and that language and math happen in the left. And we now know that that's not true. Uh, music is uh, bilateral and it engages regions throughout the brain, uh, the, um, the front, the back, the top, the bottom, the, um, and, and both sides bilaterally. This is the musician's in our laboratory being scanned while he was listening to music. And you can see the activation is clearly bilateral. And it's allowed us to prepare a kind of working map of the different areas of the brain that contribute to music. Now, this is just a subset of them. Um, expectancy and generation when you're listening to music, whether you know it or not, your brain's trying to figure out what's going to come next. Um, there's motor cortex involvement, even if you're not physically moving, motor and premotor cortex are synchronizing, neuro neuron populations there are synchronizing with the tempo of the music. And we find that people are effectively tapping the foot in their mind's ear uh, through motor cortex activation. There's cortex activation from playing or dancing or feeling the vibrations of the music. Uh, you can see all these different regions. We were the first to discover the role that cerebellum played in mediating musical emotion alongside areas of the prefortex. This was based on the work of Jeremy Schmaman, who had done a number of psychoarchitectonic studies at Harvard, showing that the cerebellum was not just a center of movement and timekeeping, but um, was involved in emotional regulation an emotional experience. And moving inside, we find that music uh, activates these particular regions, the nucleus accumbens, amygdala, again, the cerebellum, brainstem. In every study we've done, music activates the brainstem and the pons. And I'll come back to that. I promised to talk a bit about some of our work with special populations, uh, neurogenetic disorders. And I got into this kind of by accident. Um, it's, it's an interesting story. Noam Chomsky had uh, come up with some, uh, had encountered some individuals who had what he considered weird speech patterns. Those are his words, unusual speech patterns. And he called Oliver Sacks to tell Oliver about them. Uh, because in addition to their odd speech patterns, they seem to be musical. Uh, I'll call Ursula Belugi at the Salk Institute to see if she would like to go study them with him. Ursula called me as a young uh, postdoc who had just done a thesis on music in the brain. And so the three of us traipsed off to the um, to Lenox, Massachusetts and the Berkshires to a, a camp for Williams syndrome individuals and a number of, of remarkable papers and findings came out of that. Um, Williams syndrome is a rare neurogenetic mental disorder. Its character, uh, it, it occurs in about one in 20,000 live births, making it four times less common than Down syndrome, just to give you a marker.
It's characterized by the hemizygous of seen to 19 genes on chromosome 7, including the gene for elastin, and it comprises about 50,000 base pairs. Julie Kornberg, formerly of UCLA, had done a lot of the behavioral genetics on working out the deletion and what the uh, phenotypic manifestations were. The deletion of the elastin gene that I mentioned leads them to have a higher incidence of heart disease, supravalvular aortic stenosis. It also leads to um, an unusual um, myelination and wiring of the brain. Uh, limb one kinase leads to some of their visual spatial deficits, and they have particular facial features that are believed to be caused by this cluster here. Now, the odd thing about Williams is that although we've got a well-characterized genotype and a well-characterized phenotype, there are a number of cases where people who have the genetic deletion don't exhibit the phenotype, phenotypic symptoms, and by uh, people will exhibit all of the phenotypic markers without the genetic deletion. It's a uh, an area that requires a lot of further research. But um, they are generally impaired in cognitive function, mean IQ of 58, poor spatial, quantitative, and reasoning abilities, but relatively spared in that they're in their sociability. In fact, they're hyper sociable. They have relatively intact language, um, meaning that their their syntactic and semantic formation is 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 above their nominal IQ level, and they love music and learn to play instruments in spite of uh, uh, profound eye hand coordination eye hand coordination deficits in other areas. It's also important to recognize there's a great deal of variability within the group as with many groups. In our early studies, we used as comparison groups uh, people with autism spectrum disorders and Down syndrome. And there's this interesting set of dissociations, uh, double dissociations between the two populations. The communicative and affective impairments are different. So Williams syndrome, we see hypersociability. Autism, well, hyposocial, generally speaking. Williams syndrome are exceptionally sensitive to uh, the emotions of others. They're empathic. They get really upset when they see somebody who's upset. Autism is, in some respects, the opposite. Williams syndrome, uh, going, you know, correspondingly experience high empathy, and people on the spectrum tend to experience low empathy. These are, of course, generalizations, and there are exceptions. Williams syndrome had um, shown through uh, a, a number of anecdotes to have a high engagement with and understanding for music. The literature on autism was less clear. We'll get to that in a minute. There are also distinct uh, dysmorphologies. So Alan Reese, who I was a postdoc with at the medical school, had shown that cerebral volume in autism is normal syndrome, it's smaller. Paleocerebellum is normal in autism, small in Williams syndrome. And then it reverses for the neocerebellum, the cerebellar vermis areas five and six, which actually have some interesting implications for music, given that the cerebellum helps to mediate musical emotion. The very first study we did with uh, individuals with uh, Williams syndrome was we wanted to put them in a scanner and see what was going on when they listened to music. And of course, you need a control for music, so we used silence. We used scrambled music, that's music that's disordered, and sliced into a bunch of pieces and put back in random order. Uh, the reason for that is that it maintains all of the same pitches and loudness profiles, the same Fourier spectrum but it just doesn't make any sense. So it controls for the acoustic features very nicely. We also had them listen to noise because Williams syndrome individuals are famously uh, aversive to noises. They experience hypnosis uh, and a number of other anomalies 
and their responses to noise. They're fearful of, of sounds that most of us are afraid of. And getting them in the scatter was tricky because scatters are noisy. You know, uh, this is back in the in the early 2000s when um, uh, when the technology and the scan sequences were a little different. But you're in for a good hour of <clears throat> and blah, 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 you know, at like 98 decibels, which is about the sound of a 747 taking off 200 feet away on the tarmac. So we developed a very elaborate desensitization procedure and a mock scanner. We made a video that showed uh, a kid about their age, eight or 10 years old, walking into the Stanford Neuroimaging Center. The camera was down at the kid's eye view, and so you saw a lot of people's knees, and the camera would pan up to the door handle. But it gave the kids a sense of what they were in for, and it made a huge difference. We were able to get them to sit still in the scanner. So we published the first neuroimaging study ever of individuals with Williams syndrome. And here you're seeing uh, in the subtraction paradigm, music versus noise. These are age matched and uh, IQ matched control subjects, typically developing normals, but age matched and IQ matched without another uh, underlying pathology. And these are Williams syndrome individuals. And you can see that there's great consistency in the control activations and very little consistency across the Williams syndrome. Um, this person, uh, Williams 1, showed no difference between music and noise. They considered them the same. This is somebody who loved noises. And I remember this participant well. Uh, he collected vacuum cleaners. He loved noises. He couldn't tell you the name of a vacuum cleaner just by hearing its sound. Actually did this in a controlled psychophysical experiment, and he was great at it. Um, this subject liked noises too, uh, leaf blowers and fans and motors. This subject um, had, th these three subjects had more of the aversive responses to noise. But you can see that generally mapping is very different. Not shown in this figure here is that um, there was significantly greater activation in the right amygdala for all Williams syndromes that controls. And in follow-up papers, we use autism and Down syndrome as controls or comparison groups. We received a large grant from Autism Speaks to further our work in that area. And one thing that we concluded from this is that Williams brains are mapped differently than typically developing brains. We ran, um, as, a, as Dr. said, I, I started out my career as a graduate math major at MIT, and I was always interested in, in math. We took 13 regions of interest, voxels of interest uh, regions um, from the scan, and we just threw them into a multidimensional scaling program to see if without any a priori belief about going on, we could tell the difference between the Williams syndrome and the control subjects. And here you see multidimensional scaling of units in MDS are arbitrary, but it shows that very clearly there is a cluster of individuals here. Those are the controls and these are the Williams, which suggests a vastly different brain organization. So the conclusion from this set of studies was that Williams syndrome brains are differently organized from those of typically developing controls. Now, you might wonder what are the clinical implications of this? Well, I think conservatively, therapeutic techniques such as T are unlikely to work in Williams syndrome patients as they might usually do, just because the wiring of the brain is different. Al, our colleague uh, Al Galabert at Harvard has done some cytoarchitectonic studies of Williams patients who donated their brains to his lab. And the, the layering is different. Uh, the, the connectivity is different. The gray matter, white matter volume ratios are all. So it's fascinating to imagine that there are people with completely different neural organization. 
Uh, EEG and other diagnostic tools may yield invalid results. We don't know. Even pharmacological interventions that target certain systems are expected. You know, I work with Williams syndrome, who, by the way, are delightful to work with because they're so friendly. Uh, we, uh, we naturally started working with individuals with autism spectrum disorders, and we were interested in their music processing. In general, we found that music serves as an interesting window into higher cognitive function and lower perceptual function. It's, a, it's an interesting stimulus that is linguistic and yet still auditory. Um, it, it's something that almost everybody relates to and enjoys. And it reveals a number of different aspects of cognition and perception we might otherwise not be able to study. What we know about musical ability and ASD individuals is that they have a specific interest for music in general, many of them. They show enhanced discrimination. They're sensitive to specific alterations of one note in a melody more so than others. This, of course, is, uh, is well established in other domains. In the visual domain, they tend to focus on the trees rather than the forest. Williams syndrome individuals tend to be the opposite. And uh, at MIT, Navone had developed some paradigms that show uh, distinctiveness global versus local processing. ASD individuals tend to be local processors. Uh, Williams tend to be global processors. ASD individuals show memory for specific pitches more accurately than typically developing controls. Now, it does seem to, uh, that the emotional deficit characterize ASD and their musical interest might present a paradox. We know that music conveys emotion and is social, and yet, emotional and social impairments are defining factors of ASD. So we wondered if perhaps music might be an island of spared emotional and social processing in ASD. Or maybe individuals with ASD like music because of its structure and detail, and they're not responding to the emotion. One way that we studied this is that we took a set of songs that we had previously validated across hundreds and hundreds of people as conveying a couple emotions, happiness, sadness, fear or scary music, and peace. Uh, I'm going to play you some of these. I'm not going to tell you what they are. But if you're like most people, they'll be obvious. That's the solo acoustic guitarist, my friend Alex DeGrasse, guitarist who has a, a number of records and he's considered one of the founders of the New Age movement. Um, he, uh, his music and in this piece in particular are, are routinely rated by people across a, a, a range of backgrounds, experience, and even IQ. Uh, as being peaceful, but nobody had ever tested these kinds of things in people with autism spectrum disorders. Here's another one. People tend to rate that one as happy. I think you guessed that one is sad. And so by process of elimination, that leaves this one. So um, I kind of gave away the finding here uh, before I gave you the stimulus. But what we found was that uh, individuals with autism spectrum disorders were 
just as able to categorize music based on its emotional content, with um, the exception of peaceful. Um, we don't know how to account for that yet. Uh, it's an interesting question, but peacefulness is not really uh, a canonical musical emotion. We threw that in there as a kind of, uh, I guess, we just wanted to see what would happen. And in fact, you can see that even our, um, our typically developing tend to be less accurate with peaceful. Maybe peace is more subjective. Uh, what one person finds soothing and that finds annoying. I know that uh, many guitarists find Alex Degrassi annoying because he's so good and seamless. But the fact that they're responding to the music in this categorical way doesn't mean they're feeling the emotion. It may be that they only intellectually recognize the emotion. But we did consider it um, interesting and and you know, the journal considered it being in, and worthy of publishing, that they were at least able to recognize the emotion. We're still working on figuring out whether they experience the emotion. The difficulty is that experienced emotion is somewhat harder to map, uh, but not impossible, and I'll get to that in a bit. Cacophony. Uh, <laughs> my uh, clicker stopped working. Uh, this is just another way of visualizing the percentage of participants in each diagnostic who selected each emotion. Uh, so you can see again that the ASD and the typically developing normals are uh, controls are 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 equivalent uh, in most of the measures and not so much for the the peaceful music. Oh, this also represents a fusion matrix. Uh, that's the thing I like about it. So these are the percentage of people who, uh, with ASD who identified scary music as happy. You can see none of the t typically developing controls did that. But, you know, some percentage of them, about 3%, identified sad music as happy. Conclusion here is that music may represent an island of spared emotional processing among individuals with ASD. The clinical implications are that maybe the communication of emotional states and sex with individuals with ASD could be facilitated by the abuse of music. We don't know yet, but we've done some follow-up studies on this. It suggests that you might be able to uh, help increase empathy in individuals with autism by using music. Much work remains to be done on this. Now, I talked about measuring uh, musical responses, and my colleague Vinod Menon and I, uh, Vinod's at Stanford, we were both in Alan Reese's lab as postdocs, uh, and Vinod is, is now a named professor in psychiatry at Stanford, and we've continued to collaborate since the early aughts. Um, his background is in computer science, and he's very good at writing scripts that allow us to pull things out of neuroimaging data that others had been able to do. And in fact, he's well known in the fMRI community uh, for his work on Granger causality analysis and a number of other things. But um, one of our early studies showed that a, a reliable and predictable network in the brain, a circuit that was known to involve pleasure, also involves and stated by music. More so than speech, music uh, that participants found, found pleasurable engages emotional centers that mediate award and arousal. Those same networks associated with eating chocolate, ingesting opium, and having orgasms. And the network is that well-known pleasure center that Milner and Olds out in the 50s with the rats pressing their bars and getting a dopamine each time they hit it. Uh, the nucleus accumbens, the uh, ventral tegmental area uh, in particular, these regions are associated with uh, the modulation of dopamine 
And again, using Granger causality analysis and the time course of activation, we were able to infer that, in fact, music listening was uh, invoking these dopamine networks. Uh, we then designed a study that my student, Valerie Salampour, carried out using a uh, radioactive tracer for dopamine in PET, which confirmed this uh, some years later. While we were studying this data set, we noticed that many of our subjects would report that they had subjectively gone into a kind of a trance mode while they were listening to the pleasurable music. Um, not exactly sleep, but they had gone into another state, as one does when listening to music, even in the scanner. Uh, and around this time, Marcus Rakel published on the well-known default mode network, along with my former doctoral advisor, Michael Posner. And so we went back over the old data set and looked for evidence that our participants were switching into the default mode, which is known to be uh, this kind of daydreaming mode. And it turns out that they were. So uh, we were the first lab to show, um, we were the first lab to show that dopamine was involved in, uh, in mediating musical pleasure. I remember Time Magazine, when, they, when, uh, when McGill and Stanford made their joint press release, and talked about how it was the the same regions involved with uh, pleasure for drugs and sex. Time magazine said that we had discovered the sex, drugs, and rock and roll center of the brain, which I guess is silly, but maybe true. Uh, but we then were the first to show that people who listen to music enter the default mode net. And moreover, we showed that it's the insula that serves as the neurochemical switch, taking people in and out of the default mode. So the conclusions from this are that musical pleasure is subserved by the same well-known pleasure center as sex, food, and drugs. And um, I see there's a question about whether any comparison was done with subjects of different cultures when studying experiences of emotions with different types of music. Suppose I should save the questions for the end, but um, we haven't done any work on uh, cross-cultural uh, experience of music. Others have. I can talk about that during the Q&A. Our reason for not doing it isn't that we didn't want to, but grant money is tight. You'd think it would be important, uh, and I agree. The clinical implications of this work is, well, the pleasure network uh, tells us ways that we might be able to address issues having to do with anhedonia, uh, major depressive disorder, impulse control problems, OCD. I have to give a caveat that I'm not much for neurocartography. That is simply showing where in the brain something occurs. But this seems like a special case because it opens the door to a better understanding of all kinds of pleasure. And then therapies that can activate this network safely can help overcome the uh, different disorders. I wanted to get a little bit closer to understanding the, the, the neurophysiological basis of musical pleasure. I felt we had come as a field as far as we could with neuroimaging and then with uh, including with radioactive tags of dopamine. Unfortunately, there aren't any safe radioactive tags uh, that I know of for uh, tracking opioids. And so we resorted to a pharmacological intervention to see the role of opioids in musical pleasure. I'll back this out a bit. Um, to begin with, uh, as you all know, I'm, I'm confident naltrexone is a known mu opiate antagonist that's widely prescribed, it's considered very safe. We administered a double blind placebo controlly cross design. Why did we do that? Well, we know from the animal literature primarily that reward, 
has two components. There's anticipation. That's the moment that you are just about to taste that sumptuous cupcake. And then there's the consumption. So we make a distinction between anticipatory and consummatory pleasure and reward. Uh, it is uh, the neurochemical side. Pleasure is the subjective experience. So dopamine is closely linked to the anticipatory pleasure, endogenous mu opioids to the con uh, consummatory pleasure. Now, music is kind of a case because as the music unfolds, it's setting up a, a system of expectations and resolutions. And the anticipatory phase is constantly reinventing itself uh, over time. And the consummatory phase is happening over time. So the dopaminergic and the mu opioid systems are somewhat intertwined. Nevertheless, we had reasoned uh, substantial reasons to believe that um, dopamine was involved in musical pleasure. Nobody knew whether or not op opioids were, although they're involved in all those other kinds of pleasure. So our hypothesis is that if we can selectively block those mu opioids, it might attenuate musical pleasure just a bit, not entirely because we're not affecting the dopaminergic system and we don't know of a safe dopamine antagonist. Uh, so um, the question was, well, what, what can we get out of just the opioid blockade? So again, uh, fully crossed, placebo control, double blind experiment. People got naltrexone or a control a week apart. They listened to their favorite music and what we found was in the naltrexone condition, there was a significant decrease in their self-report of pleasure, either after the fact or using real-time slider ratings where they rated musical pleasure in a going fashion by moving a slider up and down. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, also, we didn't notice a significant difference, although you can see it, it's it's actually different, but not statistically different for neutral music, which we used as a control, which makes sense. Neutral music is invoking a lot less pleasure in the first place. We confirmed these findings with um, physiological measures from uh, electromyograms, EMGs from the zygomatic and corrugator muscles, where we found significant differences between placebo and naltrexone. Known muscles uh, that are affiliated and associated with expressions of pleasure in the face. So our conclusion here is that blocking opioid receptors does disrupt musical pleasure. A clinication is that music may be effective at triggering or boosting endogenous opioids without the side effects of addiction. As of 2018, the majority of prescriptions for opioid agonists in the US are dispensed to people with comorbid mood disorders, such as major depressive disorder. We've not yet developed opioid agonists that aren't addictive, um, but music may be a way to trigger or boost endogenous opioids without the side effects. Now, I'd like to put in a plug for basic science, uh, since I understand that most of you are um, clinicians uh, and uh, researchers who are constantly on the lookout for uh, clinical applications and health applications, as am I. But the, there's so much basic science work to be done on the auditory system. This is a map of the visual pathway as we know it. Uh, well-known areas V1, uh, V2, MT, which is responsible for motion detection, is up in here somewhere. Uh, uh, you know, there's color circuits here. Um, this is a, a complicated map that is based on neural circuitry. This is our equivalent understanding of the auditory pathway, which I believe is just as complicated. We just don't know enough about it yet. And I think the basic science uh, that needs to be done is worth doing. I'm going to talk a bit now about music and health, the 10 minutes we have left. Um, 
I was invited by Francis Collins to be part of an NIH symposium on music in the, the Kennedy Center. Uh, the other participant, it was a combination of lectures and performances. Charles Lim, uh, our colleague um, uh, uh, at uh, San Francisco. This is Ben Folds, Renee Fleming, conductor Edwin Outwater, uh, that's that's me, uh, neuroscientist Nina um, Krauss from Northwestern, Francis Collins, and a, a pre-scandal Jussie Smollett, who did a great job singing a really nice guy. Um, what grew out of that was that I had the opportunity to participate as a member of the Global Council on Brain Health, which every year uh, writes a white paper on a different topic. And we started in 2019 and just this year released a paper on music and brain health, which included 10 experts from across the interdisciplinary spectrum to yield a consensus statement. And some of that that we agreed on uh, included uh, findings that immunoglobulin A levels can increase following music therapy. Melatonin can increase following certain forms of music therapy. And of course, melatonin is uh, trigger cytokine production, production which enters T cell production. So there are immune system implications. Epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, levels can increase following music therapy. Uh, as you know, stress is associated with increased risk of coronary heart disease. Coronary heart disease is related to endothelial dysfunction. I don't have to tell you all this, but we find that patients who listen to joyful music can show significant increases in arterial dilation to a level obtained with aerobic activity or statin therapy. We know that music is involved in mood, subjectively and in increasing levels of serotonin and dopamine. Cortisol can decrease following meditative music. I published a paper in uh, Trends in Cognitive Science that was that one of the cover articles where we reviewed 400 different papers, Mona Chana and I, a postdoc at McGill, and we looked at a number of different uh, ways of characterizing the papers and the different neurochemical systems that showed that they were affected. Uh, um, we also find that among individuals with Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia, music is effective at treating disruptive behavior, anxiety, and depression. Uh, vast improvements in quality of life and improvements in cognition. Now, I mentioned music therapy, and the key here is that musical interventions um, need to be evidence-based. Perhaps that's obvious. There is a specialty of music therapists. There are certifications by the American Music Therapy Association. And much of what I found in reviewing the 400 papers in the literature is that the work is done by well-meaning non-music therapists. Uh, using music that they, the experimenters just happen to like rather than music that the patients like. And because music is so subjective, it's really impossible to say that the future of music therapy is that you can come up with a list of like those I played you and know that they're gonna make everybody happy. So it's not the case that we're gonna someday be able to say, oh, well, you're depressed. Take two Joni Mitchells and call me and it's more likely that uh, there'll be an increase for music therapists, certified music therapists to work with patients and clinicians and experimental researchers to help achieve certain therapeutic goals. I'd like to touch briefly on some of the quantitative work I've done just because uh, I enjoy it and it has some implications here for the things I've spoken about this is a Cometrica paper. We've had several quantitative methods papers. We've been interested in how to calibrate real-time responses when people use sliders differentially, uh, and either in terms of the range of a slider they use or uh, their reaction to sliders, their consistency. Sliders um, are great for uh, analyzing things like um, pain, 
anxiety, uh, or uh, even these kinds of experience sampling me methods that we might use on tracking one's emotional state, as if somebody uh, had bipolar disorder or MDD, and we might want to check in and, and you know, use either a physical slider or a sliding scale, a one to 10 scale, one to five scale. Um, so we've done some develops, which is fun to do and, and has some applications. We've also um, done some, made some contributions to the literature on concepts such as time. Um, imagine that you were interested in having a patient track the time of day that their seizures occur. We're interested in knowing what time of day people tend to be admitted into the ER or into the ICU. If you were to just track them linearly across time, uh, you would make some miscalculations and errors if you were looking for statistical trends because all of the normal statistics we use for normal distributions or uniform distributions along a line assume that the tails of the normal distribution extend off to infinity but in fact time is circular there is no and, and while it's infinite the tails of the distribution have to wrap onto each other and it was way back in the 20s that Lord Rock, uh, the acoustics pioneer, discovered that this was a problem. And he invented a field called circular statistics, which uh, is now a subspecialty, particularly in bio departments. And you can see here, this is a circular normal distribution around midnight for, say, uh, ER, uh, based on real data from ER admissions in Oakland. Uh, this is a somewhat... Um, less pointy distribution, but you can imagine that the distribution might be more or less uniform as shown here in the lower right, or not quite normal, but well distributed. And you'd want to be able to conduct statistics on these that respected the idea that the tails have to wrap around infinity. And so that's what statistics was developed to do. Um, just wanted to touch on it because I just think it's really a cool way to think about things and to avoid making some statistical errors. We're also looking at spherical models, three-dimensional circular models for brain activity, uh, which is a promising area. I, it, my interest in statistics got me interested in how doctors and patients communicate with one another. Um, and the topic of NNTs, numbers needed to treat, comes up with one statin that I looked at, and under McGill's legal counsel, I'm not allowed to name the particular statin, but I think most of you know which one it is. The number needed to treat is 200. And when you take into account the side effects that this, I mean, the unpleasant ones, not all of the unusual ones, but the common unpleasant ones, with this statin, because you have to give the 200 before one person is helped, that patient, you know, the average patient's 20 times more likely to be harmed by the treatment than helped by it. With prostate cancer, a radical prostatectomy, the number needed to treat is 48, and a patient is 25 times more likely to be harmed by the treatment than helped by it. Or consider antibiotic treatment of otitis media, where the NNT is 20. Um, I've advocated, at, along with many others, that we need to encourage physicians to have conversations with their patients in a way that helps them to visualize this. And this is one such way to do it that comes out of a laboratory in Britain. For the otitis media uh, case, you know, statistics are hard for the average person to understand, but they can grow this. Um, if you take antibiotics that are normally recommended and and you were to map a hundred people uh, 20 of them are going to, let's see number needs that treats 20 uh, five of the hundred people are going to be saved by this antibiotic treatment uh, a whole bunch are not going to be helped by it uh, a bunch of people will be neither helped nor harmed but you know four people are going to have serious complications so I believe that this is an important uh, 
thing to be talking about. It's part of a growing movement to help patients come prepared to meetings with their doctors so that the short time available can be used more effectively. Many of your patients are going to encounter false information on the internet. Some are going to come in with a better understanding of their condition and treatment options, allowing them to make more decisions with you. Now, this is not to say that clinical intuition is passe. Almost all medical statistics are unfortunately based on heterogeneous populations and good clinicians between the lines with the promise of genetic testing in the coming years, this will be less of a problem. But for now, I think um, clinicians need to help patients navigate through these waters uh, with a, a, an understanding of risks as benefits in pictorial fashion. And I can report to you, I just had a meeting with Stan Prusner, who won the Nobel Prize for his discovery of prions. He's working on uh, some designer tau protein drugs uh, that have some promise to combat Alzheimer's. And I heard another fascinating talk by Jim Allison just before he won the Nobel Prize on checkpoint inhibitors, which are custom designed based on genetics uh, for treating certain cancers. So there's a whole lot on the horizon that will certainly cr create more customized medicine, as you all know. But in terms of communicating with patients, uh, I think even those um, kinds of treatments can benefit from a, a more intuitive and pictorial representation. I'm going to end here and it, in order to leave time for questions. The work that I've reported here was performed in collaboration with a number of different researchers to whom I'm grateful and dozens and dozens of undergraduate research assistants, probably 50 overall. And we've enjoyed financial support from a number of different organizations. And I thank you for your kind attention. <laughs> thank you, Dan. This is really, really, a, <clears throat> what a tour de force. And uh, um, yeah, it uh, shows the remarkable scope of your contributions is uh, you know, really, really, really breathtaking. Um, and uh, we do have a few uh, questions already from the audience. Uh, one comment from our friend Susan Buchheimer, um, who highlights uh, when you were um, talking about the auditory cortex, she says Joseph Rauschecker has done some uh, good imaging work on auditory circuitry. So um, there's something that uh, we might be able to, to uh, check up on. Yeah. Absolutely, he has. And I haven't seen, I mean, he's certainly done the work that would allow somebody who knew what they were doing to extend that diagram to make it more like the Van Essen picture of the visual system, but uh, if if in fact he's done it or someone's done it, I don't know about it, and I'd love to know about it. Yeah. But All yeah, right. I'm a big Rauschecker fan. <laughs> cool. We'll continue that one offline. Um, also, we have a and a, a Bookheimer fan. Yeah, of course, we're all Bookheimer fans. <laughs> um, uh, Diana Harold and and I mean everybody should know that everybody should know that Bookheimer is a great singer. That is not as widely known. Um, so fortunately we'll have a, 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 another holiday party from the division of psychology to enable everyone to, to enjoy both Dr. Levitin and Dr. Buchheimer, um, together. Um, meanwhile, question from Diana Harold, um, uh, and I want to elaborate a little bit because I think it gets to the, uh, mechanisms of, uh, doing the treatments with music. And, and, you know, I had a question that overlaps a lot with Diana's, which is about how do we make a start on, on creating precision therapies using music. Um, so I think this is something that you've given a great deal of thought to. So what are we the next steps in that? How do we pick the right music for well, the right problem and the right person? Yeah, so I think I think there on the uh, the state of the art now is that um, a, a physician and a patient define what the therapeutic goals are whether they're for psychiatric disorders or for pain relief or what have you. Uh, and then the music therapist who normally should have a kind of musicologist's knowledge of different pieces of music and encyclopedic knowledge uh, should be able to look at the patient's collection and say to the patient, you know, what, what do you use now and how effective is it? And, you know, from that, 
kind of divide and conquer the 20 million songs that are out there and find something that'll work. Um, but I think that's not a very satisfying state of the art. Uh, there are a number of groups, startup companies and research groups working on automating this process using machine learning algorithms that extract features from the music and try to correlate them with emotions. And we tried to do, I have to tell you for, you know, the, I, I'm sure you, I'm sure some of you have had this problem, but not as badly as I've had it. But the majority of the studies that I've tried didn't work. And uh, one of the ones that famously didn't work that we threw a lot of money at was we collected over a period of two years, 12 different uh, biopsychological markers on people listening to all kinds of music. So we had heart, race, heart rate, respiration rate, uh, core body temperature, blood volume, pulse amplitude. We had blood pressure, uh, variety of EMG, e EEG, galvanic skin response. And we tried to figure out what we could take from these that would tell us that somebody was experiencing pleasure or sadness or, or distraction or pain relief. And it was just a mess. And we collaborated with fancy statisticians I have questions about what went wrong there, but um, I think that, that that's a next step, is to try and come up with an objective measure. But in the meantime, Vinod Menon and I were just talking the other day. He thinks that he can do this with fMRI now. He thinks that he can tell with great accuracy what emotional state you're in without your subjective rating in real time. Uh, and we're going to test that in the coming months. Very, very interesting. Well, that is somewhat connected to another question we have here from Nancy Lee. And uh, her question is, musical preferences notwithstanding, what accounts for the brain's perception of clearly discordant sounds like grating heavy metal as pleasurable? Why is it that some people have such differences in their appreciation of um, uh, you know, pleasure or pain from musical stimuli that are identical? Thank you, Nancy. Well, um, the uh, Plomp uh, and, well, going back to uh, Helmholtz uh, in the 1800s, but Plomp in the mid 20th century showed that um, at the level of the cochlea, there are interferences created in the tuning curves of neurons that are frequency selective. And those interference patterns sometimes lead to what we would call discordant or unpleasant sounds. And so if you're an acoustician, a psychoacoustician, you can look at a spectrogram or a Fourier spectrum and tell with some accuracy whether a person is going to find the sound grating or unpleasant. The chalk the chalkboard fingernails have a particular acoustic signature that most music doesn't. Although the Bernard Herrmann score to Psycho, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, has some of that quality there, you know, on the violins. Um, apart from that, you ask, you ask why people find some music pleasurable and other music not. There is an emerging, you know, Samir Zeki and I and Steve Palmer and others uh, have uh, contributed to the first few conferences on neuroaesthetics. And um, we, we're, one of the lines of, of pursuit there is that there may be some underlying aesthetic module in the brain that uh, determines a lot of things. Like why do some people like spicy food and some mild? And why do some people like a certain body shape in their partner and other people like a different body shape, sexual attractiveness? Uh, it seemed far-fetched at the time, but there is some emerging evidence that these things correlate. The kinds of color patterns you like to see, the kinds of um, music you like to hear. So I think that there's, you know, there, there's subjective aesthetics that we don't understand anything about. Uh, do I consider purely electronic music music? I am not going to weigh in on that, uh, but 
um, in our work, uh, I advocate that we keep a, uh, an open mind about what we consider music. If somebody else says it's music, I want to include it in a study, whether I like it or not. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Levin, I see we have uh, already exceeded our allotted time. Um, there are a million more questions that uh, I think we've already got streaming in from the audience and that I know I would love to ask about, but I, I'm afraid we have to uh, call it a day for today. Um, but thank you so much. It's been really so much fun to hear you again. And I can see our audience has uh, very much enjoyed it as well. Well, thank you very much for having me back.